Today's topic is nursing management for clients with an acute onset of a cerebral vascular accident, otherwise known as a stroke. This slide depicts facts about clients affected by stroke every year. Stroke is ranked the fifth cause of death in the United States. According to the CDC, stroke kills almost 130,000 people every year. That is about one out of every 20 deaths. On average, one person dies from stroke every four minutes. The costs of stroke are estimated to be $34 billion every year. Stroke is a leading cause of serious long-term disability. Needless to say, stroke impacts the healthcare system in many ways. So let's talk about the cause of stroke. Because stroke is such a pervasive disease in the United States, healthcare professionals have an important task in educating clients and family members of the risks and preventative strategies for stroke. Risk factors for a client include number one, having a previous stroke or TIA, otherwise known as transient ischemic attack. Number two is uncontrolled high blood pressure. 3 is high cholesterol, 4 is heart, dis heart disease such as a coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, 5 is diabetes, and 6 is sickle cell. Age is the single most important risk factor for stroke. The older you are, the more likely you're going to have a stroke. There are modifiable health behaviors that should be the focus of client education to include unhealthy diet, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, overuse of alcohol, smoking, and uncontrolled hypertension. These behaviors can be targeted as a measure to prevent stroke in clients. The non-modifiable risks include being male, African American, older age, and a family history. The older you are, the more likely again you are to have a stroke. Although stroke risk increases with age, strokes can, do, can and do occur at any age. In 2009, 34% of people hospitalized for stroke were younger than 65 years of age. Stroke is more common in men than in women. Blacks, Hispanics, American Indians, and Alaska Natives have a greater chance of having a stroke than do non-Hispanic whites or Asians. The risk of having a first stroke is nearly twice as likely, as, actually is twice as high for blacks than for whites, and blacks are more likely to die following a stroke than whites. Let's talk about the pathophysiology. A stroke, otherwise known as a brain attack, and cerebral vascular accent are all terms used to describe the same disease. Simply stated, stroke is a change in the normal blood supply to the brain. Any disruption in the blood supply to the brain affects functioning. Oxygen and glucose cannot be stored, so there must be a constant supply to maintain homeostasis. There are two types of stroke. Number one is ischemic and number two is hemorrhagic. Ischemic strokes can be further broken down into thrombotic or emboli, emboli or embolitic. Thrombotic strokes are caused by a clot resulting in a narrowing of a lumen which blocks the passage of the blood through the artery. Embolitic stroke is caused by a clot or debris that has migrated to a small narrow vessel in the brain that is too narrow to pass through. An ischemic stroke results from in inadequate blood flow to the brain from partial or complete occlusion of an artery. A hemorrhagic stroke results from bleeding into the brain tissue itself or into the subarachnoid space or ventricles. Hemorrhagic stroke is a burst in a blood vessel that allows blood to seep into the brain tissue. Refer to the Increased Intracranial Pressure podcast for further details on the pathophysiology of the effects of strokes on brain tissue ischemia, in particular increased intracranial pressure. Let's talk about the clinical manifestations. Clients who present with signs and symptoms of stroke can vary depending on the location of the tissue injury in the brain. Clinical manifestations begin with a change in level of consciousness. Again, the patient is alert and then you assess them again and they've become confused. 
or they have slurred speech, or again, they have some sort of deficit or on one side or the other. Hypertension with a potential headache, motor and sensory deficits unilaterally, speech impairment with uh, receptive or expressive, expressive aphasia, difficulty swallowing or drooling indicates a potential lack of airway protection. Key terms for neurological deficits are important to understand such as aphasia including expressive and receptive, apraxia, agnosia, hemopia, dysphagia, hemiparesis, and neglect syndrome. Let's talk about how we assess patients with strokes. As we, dis as we discuss how to assess a client with stroke, like symptoms, the timing priorities are key to client outcomes. Time is essential aspect to treatment modalities, in particular with ischemic strokes and the administration of TPA. According to the National Institute of Health, American Heart Association, and the National Stroke Center, a three-hour window is the gold standard for administration of tissue plasminogen activator, otherwise known as TPA. More studies are inconclusive whether extending a three-hour window to a six-hour window is beneficial. Past and present history is important to assess related to when the client's first onset of symptoms occurred. Some patients will not know when their symptoms occur because nobody was there to witness it. Also, it's important to understand what medications the patient is taking, allergies, recent surgical or invasive procedures, and comorbid conditions, such as diabetes. Assessing vital signs to include a pulse oximetry reading and pain assessment is important to determine hemodynamic stability, in particular because hypertension is an expected finding with early onset of stroke. An EKG and continuous cardiac monitor are necessary. The National Institute of Health has developed a recognized stroke scale to measure the baseline neurological deficits and trend the neurological changes that may develop over time. There are links to support further understanding of using the NIH stroke scale when assessing your patients. This slide depicts time saves lives. <clears throat> The National Institute of Health has developed national guidelines for stroke treatment throughout every emergency department. Again, clients who present with stroke are prioritized based on the timing of treatment. As soon as the client enters the emergency department, the timer begins. From door to assessment, from a physician is 10, from a physician actually assessing is 10 minutes. Door to stroke team notification is 15 minutes door to transporting the client to CT is 25 minutes. Door to CT interpretation from a radiologist is 45 minutes. The primary concern is ruling out a hemorrhagic stroke in order to prepare the client for TPA if it is ischemic. Door to administering TPA is 60 minutes. That is the gold standard. Administering TPA has a significant risk for bleeding. Thus, if any puncture or procedure like Foley catheter and placement are needed, they should be completed prior to the TPA. Lastly, door to admission to the ICU is three hours. Hospitals are required to report these timing standards. Let's talk about right and left brain damage. Upon assessment, manifestations of right-sided brain damage include a paralyzed left side, tendency to ignore objects or people on that left side, spatial perception deficits such as misjudging distance or inability to pick up an object, button a shirt or tie their shoes. These patients often experience short-term memory loss and are impulsive. They misjudge their ability to perform tasks at the same level as before the stroke. For example, try to walk without assistance. Manifestations of left brain damage include a paralyzed right side, speech and language are affected, these patients are slow and cautious and need frequent instruction and feedback to complete tasks. They have a short, shortened retention spans and difficult in learning information. 
Many experience depression, anxiety, and impaired comprehension related to language and math skills. The client must be evaluated within 10 minutes of arrival to the, into the emergency department. The priority is obviously ABCs and assessing the airway, breathing, and circulation, as well as disability. Disability is all those neurological deficits. The rapid neurological assessment is focused on the client's level of consciousness, orientation, speech pattern, cognitive functioning, as well as motor and sensory deficit identification. The NIH stroke scale must be completed within 20, 25 minutes. Baseline lab values are important to assess potential secondary complications as well as anticipating supportive medication therapy like anticoagulants. A non-contrast head CT as well as a chest x-ray is facilitated. A chest x-ray rules out secondary complications. An ischemic stroke results from an inadequate blood flow to the brain from partial or complete occlusion of an artery. A hemorrhagic stroke results from bleeding into the brain tissue itself or into the subarachnoid space or ventricles. You can see in this particular slide the normal CT scan and then to the right is an actual hemorrhage and the white portion is where the hemorrhage is occurring. You typically should see in an ischemic stroke, stroke no changes. So on the left side, the normal CT scan is what we're aiming for for an ischemic stroke. Again, we're ruling out hemorrhagic stroke because TPA would worsen and facilitate death in those types of patients. The plan of care for an acute onset of stroke is to restore adequate cerebral perfusion and limit brain tissue injury and death. You can see here two hours um, after the onset of symptoms and then 6.5 hours after the onset and the spread of the hemorrhagic stroke in the CT scan. So again, neurological deficits and assessing those will be important throughout the care of the patient, in particular in the immediate phase of stroke. Let's talk about some of the interventions. Upon admission to the emergency department, the interventions are focused on diagnosing the type of stroke because the brain needs two important ingredients for functioning, oxygen and glucose. A bedside bl blood glucose is checked, even if the patient isn't diabetic. A hy hypoglycemic event can mimic a stroke. Eliminating, eliminating this potential cause of neurological deficit is important. Placement of two large bore IVs and obtaining labs allows administration of medication therapy and baseline information on hemodynamics. Applying oxygen as needed and recognizing airway management will be a priority depending on neurological changes from the evolving stroke. Cardiac monitoring and EKG baseline information is important as well as anticipating the need to manage severe hypertension and with clients with a progressing stroke. Transporting the client to CT is a time goal in order to rule out or rule in thrombolytic therapy based on the type of stroke. The time a client enters the emergency department until the CT scan is read should be within 45 minutes. In order to meet the necessary timing goals, a team approach to, to client care is the gold standard. With the development and refinement of the vascular stents, carotid artery angioplasty with stenting has become very common. The interventional radiology procedure is done with local anesthesia or moderate sedation. Again, these are opening up those cerebral vessels in order for blood flow to get through those tissues. A hemorrhagic stroke occurs if an artery in the brain leaks blood or ruptures. The first steps in treating a hemorrhagic stroke are to find the cause of bleeding in the brain and then control it. Unlike ischemic strokes, hemorrhagic strokes aren't treated with antiplatelet medications and blood thinners for the obvious reasons. These medications will make bleeding worse. Surgery may be needed to treat hemorrhagic stroke, like aneurysm clipping, as depicted in this picture. A next type of intervention is called coil embolization. Another treatment for hemorrhagic stroke due to an aneurysm is this coil embolization. The usual treatments for 
artery venous malformation is using interventional therapy to block abnormal arteries or veins and prevent bleeding from vascular lesions. Carotid enterectomy is a widely used surgical procedure to prevent progressing stroke in symptomatic clients re with recurrent TIAs or carotid stenosis. These clients will present with dizziness uh, as part of their history and again you might need to assess the carotids and see if there are any bruises, which would indicate there might be some plaque buildup. The purpose is to remove arthrosclerotic plaque from the inner lining of the carotid ar artery. So again, blood flow could be restored to the brain. Evaluation of outcomes. The client is most at risk for increased intracranial pressure resulting from edema during the first 72 hours after the onset of the stroke. The evaluation of the first 48 to 72 hours is focused on adequate cerebral perfusion and salvaging brain tissue and consequent cognitive, motor, and sensory deficits and the ability to function as independent as possible. Baseline ICP remains less than 15 to 20 millimeters per mercury is an important goal. Again, ICP remains stable after nursing interventions or environmental stimuli. The client would remain oriented to time, place, person, and situation. Level of consciousness remains stable, and there's no evidence of neurological compromise would be a goal. This concludes the presentation on nursing management for clients with stroke, part one.